Welcome to Around the Empire, the show that takes you around the U.S. Empire. I'm your host, Dan Wright. I'm your co-host, Joanne Leon. And on today's show, April 13th, 2017, we interview Peter Lee, a.k.a. China Hand, on U.S.-China relations in the age of Donald Trump. Here is that interview. Peter Lee, also known as China Hand, is the proprietor of the China Matters website, and the host of NewsBud Independent Media's weekly China Watch webcast. He's been watching China for over 40 years, first as a businessman in China and then as an analyst and commentator. His work has appeared at Counterpunch, Japan Focus, Asia Times, and the South China Morning Post. Hello, Peter. Welcome to Around the Empire. It's great to have you. Hey, Pete. It's great to be here, Joanne and Dan. So we watched your latest China Watch segment, and uh, we have interesting times right now with China. I thought maybe we'd talk about the the Xi Jinping visit and whether or not China really did enjoy the beautiful chocolate cake. Maybe some on the, obviously, the cruise missile strikes and theory of reconstruction. And then also on North Korea. So hopefully we can fit all that into the time that we have together. Why don't you give us a little overview for people who haven't watched that segment yet, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Can you give us your assessment on Xi Jinping's visit here and uh, whether he did enjoy the beautiful chocolate cake? Well, I don't think he enjoyed the chocolate cake too much. Uh, The theme of my video is Trump uh, treated Xi Jinping as a second banana, who was uh, there basically to uh, enjoy a performance of Donald Trump's uh, military awesomeness. You know, the uh, famous story about the chocolate cake is that uh, Trump, as they were enjoying, as he put it, a beautiful piece of chocolate cake, he leaned over to Xi and told him that he was cruise missling the crap out of uh, Syria. And, uh, you know, that's that's the sort of unscripted event that Chinese leaders really don't like when they come to the United States. They like everything to be sort of uh, set up and orderly. But uh, more to the point, I think that uh, that was the key event in the meeting because it it uh, demonstrated to uh, Xi Jinping that Donald Trump is not uh, Barack Obama in that he's uh, quite happy to uh, use American power uh, unilaterally, extra-legally, and without warning. So uh, that's, I think, the message he took back. Yeah, and um, not only that, but to use it as a tool of diplomacy, if you could call it that. You know, to I, I'm not sure if it was meant to like you said, to call him a second banana or to be, belittle or intimidate the man. I'm generally not very sympathetic to uh, Xi Jinping. I, I don't really have strong feelings about him either way. But I found myself feeling kind of sorry for that guy, you know, wondering <laughs> basically how I would have felt if I had, had been put in that position. And I'm pretty sure that I would want to say, as little as possible and get the heck out of there as quickly as I could. I also wonder what uh, she's, you know, ministers and his, whatever you call his cabinet, you know, what they were thinking at that time. I mean, I can't imagine the reaction in China. Well, I think that, uh, you know, the reaction was that uh, we have the famous madman theory, which uh, Donald Trump, I think is an aficionado of when it comes to his, uh, his dealings with China. He always wants to uh, lead his interlocutors with the uh, anxiety that he might just do something totally nutso in the, in terms of uh, using military force and retaliating. And, uh, you know, after the, after she got back to uh, China, he apparently did make a phone call to Donald Trump to assure him that he was going to, uh, that China was going to do something about North Korea. And also, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but on Syria, China abstained from the, uh, Syria resolution on the chemical attack thing instead of joining Russia to do a veto, which I took also as a sign that, uh, you know, Xi Jinping's team is saying, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's accommodate Donald Trump for now. Let's not, uh, let's not go up against him uh, on this, uh, on this issue of Syria, which I thought actually was, uh, was rather significant. The UN Security Council. Yeah, I did notice that. I'd have to go back and look at the record. Only one has to veto it, obviously. But yeah, they could have voted no, at least. Yeah, well, that they, would have been a veto. Vetoed yes, the they. last one. And China and China's representative to the UN has been quite unambiguous 
in the in China's insistence that before people throw cruise missiles out there and uh, start condemning Assad, that they there should be a, a uh, an investigation of the attack. And I don't think that's changed at all. The only thing I think that changed was that uh, Xi Jinping wanted to uh, extend some sort of conciliatory gesture towards Donald Trump by not uh, going against the United States and the uh, other members of the uh, Security Council in openly vetoing that uh, resolution. Right. And China does have people in, in Syria. They have, I'm not sure if they have any actual military there, but we I know that they have people training medics and other resources, and, and they are gearing up for a very, very large reconstruction project. So they, they have a strong interest. There was a recent interview, Assad did an interview with Chinese media, and they talked about a few things, but I would say at least half the interview focused on reconstruction in China. And the journalist asked Assad, you know, well, what would you want China to be involved with? And Assad's like, you know, China can do anything they want in reconstruction. I don't know if you saw that interview. It was very conciliatory. And, you know, a lot of people are interested in reconstruction in Syria, which is interesting. Going all the way back to 2013, in fact, before Obama said that he was going to do regime change strikes, basically in in August, September of 2013, some Four or five months before that, April of 2013, this story didn't get a lot of coverage, but General Wesley Clark uh, mm-hmm. hooked up with a with an investment fund that was focused on Syria reconstruction, which I, which I thought was curious, mm-hmm. very sort of prescient of him. You know, like, I guess that didn't work out because now it's been <laughs> four years. But, <laughs> but even back then, you know, and then also Boris uh, Johnson in London was very interested in reconstruction of Palmyra because it's an ancient site. And anyway, yeah. reconstruction's mentioned a lot, but China seems to be the front runner on. Well, everybody talks a good game about reconstruction, but uh... Yeah, you know, it's uh, you know, I've seen estimates that it's going to cost a trillion dollars to uh, put uh, Syria back together again. And the important thing was that uh, whenever things got fucked up, excuse me, whenever things got <laughs> up in the uh, Middle East before, it used to be Saudi Arabia, you know, and the GCC countries that uh, would uh, step up. You know, places like Lebanon and uh, and so on. But um, they're not interested in uh, helping out uh, Assad. And I don't think Iran, which is his closest ally in the region, has the uh, financial heft to do it. So, yeah, I think everybody is saying that, uh, you know, everybody wants contracts for reconstruction if uh, if we move into a post-conflict era. But the only people who are going to be able to finance that is China. And I think China recently put out a video on its uh, One Belt, One Road project, which actually includes a vignette from Syria, which you normally don't see nowadays. And I think that was a pretty clear message that uh, China, uh, because of uh, geostrategic and also internal economic reasons, is ready to do a big, big deal in Syria. But they have to be able to go in and do it, and uh, uh, Assad has to stay. And so it's an interesting geopolitical thing. And isn't that, Peter, isn't that a larger, I mean, I remember seeing, because one of the, I guess one of the few people I've actually been following the Afghanistan war, the endless war in Afghanistan. And I remember there being this kind of uh, frantic report about how Afghanistan actually had all these mineral resources, right? I don't know if you remember this report about selenium or some, some other things, but in fact, China owned it, that it was a Chinese firm that owned it. And that, you know, the U.S. had once again gotten roped in to provide up any security for Afghanistan. I don't know how true that report was. It got a lot of mainstream play because it kind of played to a narrative of, you know, the dumb American pitiful giant to go back to Nixonian madman theory. Mm -hmm. Uh, The pitiful giant, the Americans are in there fighting the Taliban and the insurgents, cashing in on these mineral resources. But I I just want to pivot from that point while you respond to that and say, is China doing in the Middle East, what it's doing in Africa and other parts of the world, which is grabbing resources for its expanding economy, or is that mostly hype? Well, there's uh, in terms of resources in the Middle East, the only resources in the Middle East that uh, China is interested in are oil and gas, and those are major strategic issues for them. I think that uh, China lifts more oil from Iraq than any other country. I think the uh, primary uh, purchaser now of both, both Saudi and Iranian crude. So that, I think, is the alpha and omega for uh, China's interest there. 
in Afghanistan, you know, the uh, most important uh, Chinese uh, interest there is the uh, copper mine at Messinac. And I'm sure you, I don't know if you watched that uh, that thrilling documentary about uh, how there's this uh, ancient Buddhist uh, archaeological site in the middle of the copper mine. But uh, China has basically uh, signed an agreement to develop that mine. And uh, because uh, the uh, demand for copper has uh, declined in China since they signed that agreement, now they're slow walking it. But China does use... Uh, agreements to develop mineral projects in places like Afghanistan and Africa as geopolitical placeholders. They deny those resources to other people, and also they attract the uh, desperate attention of the local government, which is waiting for China to put a few billion dollars into those projects to develop them. But uh, I think the uh, general rap on uh, China and Afghanistan is misplaced. Uh, Basically, uh, I think the Chinese realized that the uh, the U.S. strategy to try to defeat the Taliban was uh, futile. And now, and I think it was a, a relatively unreported story, I think the United States has come around to that understanding and that it's necessary to bring the Taliban into the Kabul government. And uh, I'm sure you saw the thing about the mega bomb that got dropped on uh, ISIS Khorasan in Afghanistan this morning. This morning, yep. Yeah. And, biggest, uh, biggest non-nuclear explosion uh, in history, right? Yeah, and, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, hoo hawing about this, how this is just more Donald Trump dick measuring. But I think that, uh, you know, a theme that I have been pushing in my uh, pieces recently is that uh, Donald Trump and the U.S. uniform military are very much on the same page that they want to uh, knock down ISIS, not just in uh, in Syria and Iraq, but also all those all those foreign fighters, and there are thousands of them, are going to be returning to Central Asia. They'll be looking for havens in Afghanistan. And uh, I, I think that this uh, attack on ISIS Khorasan with the big, big bomb was probably part of that, in that they're, uh, they want to obliterate a uh, ISIS haven in uh, Afghanistan so that the fighters don't have a convenient place to go. Also, the other thing is that the you know, the United States financed the construction of gigantic uh, underground uh, tunnel complexes in that part of Afghanistan. And it's quite possible that if you're really serious about wanting to take them out, I mean, these were places that were big enough to park a tank in. In fact, I was reading about one of them at Jawa, and uh, they actually, uh, these caverns go for, you know, half a mile into the middle of a mountain, and they were big enough that they actually stored the Russian tanks, the Mujahideen stored the Russian tanks that they had acquired in those caverns to drive them out when they needed to. So, you know, it might be that they actually did need a huge bomb to uh, take out one of those caverns. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, that was, I I can't help but think when and on to uh, meet the press and describe these underground labyrinths and all these things, but some of that was actually true. We, I mean, some of the stuff they talked about with Bin Laden seemed out we built outlandish. That's the point. We know exactly where they are. <laughs> <laughs> we built them for the Mujahideen against the Soviets. You know. Ah, right. Okay. So it's kind of like Saddam's chemical weapons. Like, how could he not have them? We we gave them to him. To him. Yeah. So the <laughs> Russians, the the Soviets, fought some pitched battles. You know, involving whole you know battalions and regiments trying to go in there and uh, take out these uh, caverns. So anyway, so yeah, when I saw that thing, you know, I wasn't thinking, well, they just want to make a big noise in uh, eastern Afghanistan. You know, I'm thinking, you know, you know, maybe the uh, ISIS Khorasan had taken over some of those old uh, first-class caverns, and it was uh, the United States finally decided they would, as we say, retire them. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, what about the? I just the other part of the question that maybe you would you would have a unique insight into. What about the idea of China's more global strategy moving out of the Middle East for a second? That because unlike the U.S. now, in fairness, the U.S. has there's a law in the books called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So a lot of American companies can't, in theory at least, do a lot of these business deals where they do kicks beyond the customs level. There's actually an exemption. But China apparently has not only does it not have any real provisions against bribing local officials or, or national officials in Africa and elsewhere. It also has none. It doesn't do these little lectures that America likes to do on human rights and other things like that. And, and so what it seems to be from reports I've read is that developing country governments that may be kleptocracies are much more inclined to work with China than even Europe, which doesn't have a foreign corrupt practices act. Is that true at all? Or is that overstated? What's your read on that? Well, I'm, I don't uh, personally engage in African corruption, but I think that's uh, that is uh, definitely the case. 
Um, there are uh, regimes down there in uh, Africa. They're very happy to deal with China because uh, there's, uh, you know, there's none of this knuckle wrapping over uh, corruption. And uh, and it was also true, you know, of the uh, the Japanese when they went into these resource rich countries back in the day. The United States and Europe are on sort of one camp. And, uh, you know, the uh, Koreans and the Asians and the Chinese are sort of in the other camp. But, uh, you know, you got to you got to uh, go along to get along and uh, you have to do some payoffs. So I'm not saying I know anything, but, you know, it seems to me, <laughs> it seems to me quite, uh, quite likely that uh, there are uh, governments of that uh, of that ilk. And also the other thing is that AFRICOM, you know, is really moving into uh, in, into Africa and trying to uh, set the uh, set the tone for uh you know, the alliances that these uh, African governments have with the United States. And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, consideration that you need to have a second option for, uh, you know, geopolitical alignments. It used to be, you know, Russian Soviets versus Americans, you know, now it's more of a uh, Chinese versus Americans. You want to play one off against the other. Right. And China, for you know, not everybody knows this, but China had a role in African politics for a long time. Uh, the North Koreans actually have a role and they have, they're aligned with Mugabe in Zimbabwe, if you can believe it. But, you know, there was this famous uh, meeting between Mobutu, who is a president of what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. I believe he renamed it Zaire. He met with Mao Zedong and uh, upon their meeting, Mao said, man, I've tried, I've paid a lot of people to kill you. And, <laughs> and, and Mobutu responded, yeah, you bet on the wrong man. Ooh, and so... China has been, you know, having its a little role. Now it has a more of an economic role. The Cold War is over, obviously. But there is, nothing's matching Africa, Com. We've, we've done some reporting on this. They're in over, what, 30 countries. They're in the Central African Republic. They have permanent bases. Uh, Nick Terse of uh, Tom Dispatch, the footprint in over almost every country in the region. They've had special forces or joint operations. But China seems to be reinforcing its economic relationships, because I, I understand it, that they actually are slowly but surely forging some military relationships. Didn't they try to develop a base in North Africa? Yeah, the old-fashioned, uh, the traditional, I should say, you know, explanation for China's attempts to uh, have influence overseas were basically key to economics, you know, investment, corruption, you know, giving stuff away, you know, sending workers over there. But uh, the Chinese have gotten serious about uh, developing power projection. Now. You know, they got their aircraft carrier and the only purpose of that is it's not going to fight the, uh, it's not going to fight the seventh fleet. It's going to sail around and, uh, you know, be there, you know, for power on tap, East Asia or South Asia or Africa. They've expanding their Marine Corps, which is uh, for, you know, which is used for overseas adventures. It's, uh, it's gonna, they're going to have a hundred thousand people there. They're developing, you know, amphibious carriers. One of the, uh, things for China now is that they want to be able to be a power projecting, a military power projecting uh, nation. But they'll, they'll tend to be careful about it because they, they basically have to get into the nooks and crannies where they don't directly confront the United States. But they want to be able to say that uh, we can uh, we can take care of ourselves. One of the things was that it used to be, for instance, in, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Chinese always relied, you know, when there, there was always a bunch of hostage taking, the Taliban would take some, you know, guys who were setting up uh, cell phone towers hostage or something like that. But traditionally, the Chinese relied on the local security services to do that. But uh, I don't think they want to do that anymore. I think they want, uh, they want to have their own power projection capabilities, especially in these uh, regions where Chinese interests and Chinese citizens are at risk. Well, they go hand in hand, right? I mean, that was the whole idea that the Marshall Plan required the Truman Doctrine because, I mean, that was the whole, like, what's the point of a bushel of wheat unless there's a bayonet to back it up? So <laughs> China's going to have all this economic presence. Don't They're going to have to have power projection to secure it, right? Because, you know, unless you really want to, <laughs> unless they want to rely on the international courts or goodwill or something, right? You know, you know they got their, uh, they got their hair must a bit in Libya, you know, when uh, I'll have to look into that and see if they were finally able to get some of their money out. But, uh, Basically, when Libya blew up there, uh, China was the major foreign contractor in Libya, and they had some big projects over there. And one of the things that the United States was doing was sort of holding that compensation hostage to uh, get China to, uh, you know, to go along with whatever, you know, the United States was trying to do post-construction in Libya. And I don't think the Chinese liked that very much. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so the... Uh, 
I don't know if they would actually go in there and uh, in Africa and do that sort of thing. But uh, certainly when they look at uh, South Asia, they look at Afghanistan and Pakistan. Those are vital those are vital Chinese interests, especially because uh, they're worried about uh, Islamic militancy down there. And uh, if they feel those places need to be uh, put in order with direct Chinese military power, I think they're developing that capability. Peter, you mentioned that they don't want to mess too much with the United States, but in Djibouti, you know, that was that's a pretty brazen move. They're beginning a base, building a base there, from what I've read, you know, competing for contracts with the local government to rebuild to actually build it's not a very developed area as far as i know i mean that looks like a direct confrontation well i see the thing was that the the pretext for going into that area was always the somali pirates and um you know so they can always say well you know we're part of a team that was the first chinese uh overseas adventure was uh, joining these anti-piracy patrols and just as an amusing sideline there was something where a uh a (laughs) Tuvaluan freighter was uh, taken over by uh, Somali pirates and the PRC sent a destroyer over there. And this was, you know, I can't remember. It was someplace off of Africa, obviously. So anyway, so the the Indian Navy and the Chinese Navy cooperated in order to, uh, as they say, neutralize this, uh, this threat. But uh, the Indians uh, credited the Chinese with helping out, but the Chinese were apparently dicks and just said, we did it ourselves. And Chinese domestic media is not reporting that it was a joint operation with the Indians. So they can, I think in Djibouti, you know, they can get away with that because, uh, you know, as I said, it's a locus of the, uh, you know, the East Africa anti-piracy thing. And the Red the Red Sea and Strait yeah. Mandeb, is it straight there? Mm-hmm. It's a pretty busy spot lately. Yeah, you know. I find it hard to get excited about the Djibouti base. You know? it's <laughs> yeah. Mainly, it's mainly as a training thing. The other thing that you pointed out was that uh, the Chinese did start to develop a presence in Syria. Again, I don't think that was a situation where they were, um, you know, looking to project military power in there because it's just too far for them. Basically, the Russians are doing it. But this was a situation where they wanted to show that uh, they were operating in Assad territory, you know, under legal color thereby buttress the legitimacy of the Assad government at the same time, everybody's saying Assad must go, Assad must go. And that way, you know, uh, allow him to uh, have another reason to stay on so they could go in there and uh, scoop up these, uh, these reconstruction contracts. It it definitely seemed like a signaling at the time, Mm -hmm. but no, I mean, they were clear they weren't going to send fighting troops in there, Yeah, for sure. but they were going to contribute and, you know, they were going to signal Speaking of that piece in your China Watch segment where they mentioned Syria and they're making the Aleppo soap for export to China, in the Silk Road, do you know if there's a piece of it going through there or one of their ports? Or The Silk Road is, uh, you know, is basically the Silk Road went everywhere. If you're looking at the medieval Silk Road, so, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a nice... Uh, it's a nice way to give historical color to, um, you know, to justification to whatever they're trying to do there. But uh, yeah, sure. You know, I can say it went through Aleppo and, uh, you know, it went through Greece. Not really, you know, but uh, the, uh, uh, I correct me, but I think that the traditional routing was, you know, like uh, from the Levantine cities to Venice and then, uh, you know, on to, uh, on to Europe. But, uh, you know, they're using that. Uh, they're really, the, uh, the Chinese really see, uh, you know, this sort of, uh, anxiety with uh, Trump as an opportunity to uh, cause a realignment of attention and interest from uh, countries throughout Eurasia. Now, Trump stepped back on the TPP, you know, so China steps up. And uh, I don't know about the economics of a lot of things they're trying to do. Just to me, it seems sending stuff by train to London from China is probably not as good as putting it on a boat. But the point is China's got money to spend and they're being super aggressive, and uh, the whole idea is that they want to uh, cause this uh, realignment where China is never going to face a united front of, you know, Western powers seeking to contain it again. That's what uh, this uh, this situation with Trump gives them. It gives them the time to uh, do some uh, lasting, if not permanent, damage to the whole Clinton-Obama containment strategy. Yeah, the so, pivot to Asia is over, right? <laughs> they said that. I mean, I, Pamela, what's her name? Thornton, uh, Assistant Secretary Thornton says, we're not using that word anymore. The pivot is over. Good for her. I was never a fan of the pivot. So tell us about North Korea. 
it's still there, you know. <laughs> Trump bragged that uh, two shipments of coal turned around and China sent them back to, to North Korea. No, but then this morning I read that China warned against using any force in North Korea and said that their trade with North Korea increased. So, well, I mean, can I actually let's let's on top of that, ask about this quote, which is amazing to me. And this is uh, in the Wall Street Journal. Trump said they hit it off during their first discussion. Mr. Trump said he told his Chinese counterpart he believed Beijing could easily take care of the North Korea threat. Mr. Xi then explained the history of China and Korea, Mr. Trump said. Quote, after listening for 10 minutes, I realized it's not so easy, Mr. Trump recounted. <laughs> I felt true. pretty strongly that they had a tremendous power over North Korea. What do you think? Unquote. <laughs> Response? Well, you know, I have to admit that, uh, you know, uh, one thing I say is I am not a uh, uh, I am not a uh, partisan of the Trump is an idiot uh, uh, thing. But uh, every once in a while, he does come up with a few zingers like that. But uh, let me tell you the uh, the interesting point, you know, that uh, I've harped on for the last five or six years is that uh, there's a deep alienation between North Korea and China and uh the one reason why I don't worry too much about a war between North Korea and the United States is that uh, the United States and North Korea have been trying to normalize relations somehow, you know, for the last decade, ever since the uh, the neocons led by John Bolton were sidelined from uh, from the George W. Bush administration. We've been having, uh, you know, behind the scenes contacts and all that crap. And North Korea has been trying to shed the reliance on China ever since it's existed. It was, it started out as a Russia, a Soviet client, never had good relations with China, but you know, it's, it's basically, uh, it's basically hung up with those things. And the one point I always want to make is, you know, those nuclear uh, weapons and missiles, they point West as well as East, you know? And uh, one of the reasons that Kim Jong-il and those guys are so keen on developing that nuclear deterrent is they want to, they want to, they want to intimidate China as well. And uh, so, uh, you know, China has been perfectly happy to uh, see the United States and North Korea continue in a uh, spirit of hostility because it wants to keep North Korea under its thumb. It basically treats it as a uh, as a uh, colony for economic exploitation as far as it can go. And so, you know, that's maybe that's what Xi Jinping explained to him. You know, he says that, uh, you know, uh, you know, if I if I put a uh, he probably said something like, you know, if I put a. uh, if I put a full blockade on them, they're just going to launch a nuke at, uh, you know, at uh, Beijing, you know? What's China's ideal situation or relationship with North Korea, do you think? Well, they would like to see a, a peace treaty between the United States and uh, North uh, Korea. And uh, one of these things that I was harping on in my uh, th- one of my previous China Watch episodes is that once the North Korean threat is diminished by a peace treaty is that uh, South Korea has a lot less reason to be a enthusiastic member of the U S Alliance. Basically um, South Korean economics and diplomacy is now dominated by China. And what keeps the United States hanging on there, you know, and keeping uh, South Korea from switching to a, uh, a pretty much uh, Chinese alignment is the fact that uh, there's, uh, the United States uh, is the security provider for uh, South Korea, and uh, South Koreans are pretty worried about the North Koreans doing something totally goofy to them. So uh, one reason I think that the uh, United States has always slow-walked peace negotiations with uh, North Korea, well, there's two reasons. One reason is that uh, once you got the North Korean threat, you can, you can keep a lot of uh, allies and uh, military gear in North Asia to c- contain China while pretending it's about North Korea. But the other reason is that, uh, you know, when uh, when there's peace with North Korea, you know, the uh, U.S. loses uh, its mission in South Korea. Right. And Japan, right? It would hurt, it would hurt the justification for U.S. able to sort of, I guess, stockpile and have a major presence in Japan, wouldn't it? Well, you know, what can I say? It's always, uh, you know, uh, we've, China is now, it used to be, you know, we pretended that we were an honest broker in uh, East Asia. And uh, that pretty much went went by the wayside with the uh, pivot when it was, uh, 
it was clear that uh, we did have a China containment policy and China is a strategic competitor slash adversary slash question mark. And, uh, the, you know, the Japanese can always, uh, the Japanese can always uh, keep the pot boiling by, uh, you know, conflict with the China over the Senkakus, you know, those, those little right, islands, islands yeah. like Taiwan. So um, I think that uh, I'm not worried about the uh, 7th Fleet pulling out of Yasukuni or anything like that. But uh, the interesting thing was that it actually came up a few weeks ago is that if we uh, do a peace treaty or some sort of, you know, normalization with North Korea that doesn't involve immediate denuclearization, another problem for the United States is that South Korea will go nuclear to keep a deterrent against North Korea. Right now they're under the umbrella, you know, the U.S. nuclear umbrella. And, but uh, if, it's, if we're making nice with the North Koreans and the North Koreans are allowed to keep their nuclear arsenal instead of preemptively uh, denuclearizing, then South Korea has already announced they're going to go uh, nuclear, and uh, at least the conservatives in the parliament. And if South Korea goes nuclear, then Japan goes nuclear. And uh, so what does that leave the United States as a, a strategic guarantor in Asia? You know, the big part of it was always, you guys don't need to go nuclear. We got our nuclear umbrella here. But everybody's got nukes. You know, the United States uh, position is, is going to deteriorate. And Rex Tillerson actually referred to that on his trip to Asia. So the U.S. knows about that issue. What's strange is that Donald Trump, at one point in the campaign, explicitly supported now he went back on that. He said, "Why don't we? Why do we have to provide security? Let Japan go nuclear. Let Saudi Arabia go nuclear. And why do we have to even do anything?" And now he's, I guess, completely one eighty on that, much like he has with NATO today and or yesterday. And I, but it was an interesting strategy at one point, and that people, the American people at least, I think this was a position in the Republican presidential primary, kind of said, "Yeah, why not?" Yeah. You know what? Let's let them take care of their security. Let's let them go nuclear, and then we. But I think what Trump didn't understand, or or maybe he did understand, didn't care. But what most people should know is that, you know, American corporate power. That's why America is there. That's why the security rackets are there for the American Empire. Is they need to keep Asia open, just like the British needed to keep China open way back when. So that's what they're afraid of. They're afraid of China's state capitalism overtaking them and eventually pushing them out. Is that a fair assessment? I'd say that's a, uh, that was, I have to say, yeah, because um, when you look at the uh, Chinese economic power, it's the largest trading partner of every, pretty much every country in the world, I guess. I can't even think of, I guess the United States, I'd have to look at that. Maybe Canada still has uh, more trade than uh, China with the United States, but all those countries out there, you know, when you look at places like Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, and those, their orientation towards China is increasing. And, uh, you know, the TPP was supposed to turn that around, you know, and uh, the, make sure that it was uh, American capital and not Chinese capital that was getting all the goodies in those, in those particular parts of the world. So, yeah, you know, containment and uh, hostility to China is, is a way of keeping the open door open you know, for, uh, for American companies out there. No, I'm just trying to see, you know, for a minute, it seems almost a minute after the cold war ended and the defense rackets, the military industrial complex, whatever, we're looking for some way to start justifying the defense budget again, without uh, the Soviet Union, they started looking at China. This is before the war on terror came up and, and did fit the bill for a minute at least. Remember, this is when the spy plane went down and there was all this chess beating, particularly among the neoconservative think tanks. It still kind of reverberates a little bit, but just not as present. And it looked like the reason there was a struggle of sorts, because for people who don't know, yes, China's taken a lot of U.S. manufacturing jobs, but Export, Import and Wall Street have made a killing in China. So mm -hmm. there's kind of these competing U.S. interests about a, having this relationship with China what the crossover point is for the more hawkish defense posturing to get to, to win their seat at the table. They had, do you remember this period? I guess I should ask that first. Do you remember this period when there was a, when China was the new official enemy or attempts were made at that? This is like the, I guess the nineties. I was around in the nineties. Um, I, I, I can even remember when the first post cold war, enemy of choice was drugs. And uh, remember, we we're going to go and, uh, you know, uh, uh, take care of drugs in Colombia and all that sort of stuff. And Panama. Yeah. yeah. 
Dick Cheney was a was a bear for um, you know the China threat. A lot of this um, strategic posturing goes back to uh, uh, this study that was pointing out that China was going to rise and it was dependent on oil supplies from the Middle East, and so that drove a lot of uh, the strategy. We had to you know lock up the Middle East. Believe it or not, the whole Middle East strategy, at least its formal justification for Cheney, was that that way, if we controlled the Middle East, we'd have our boot on the neck of China as far as energy was concerned. And so the Chinese have, of course, you know, run with that themselves. And now they're trying to diversify their energy supplies all over the place. But um, the whole China, the whole China threat thing was uh, was basically baked in from uh, from the '90s, at least. Well, and there's a corresponding. I don't know if you if you're familiar with this guy. He's apparently related to the Pillsbury fortune. And Pillsbury, he wrote a that guy Pillsbury? Yeah. And I mean he's actually of that Pillsbury. So he's I guess he's one of these, you know, guys got a lot of money, so uh, this is what he works on. I don't know. But he wrote this book, which is kind of the polar opposite, where he says there is this I just want to get you to respond to this. So I'm not saying you're in here, but just which you know, red flag number one right there. But that there's this hundred year plan among the senior Chinese defense to not just break China free and have China be a regional power, but a kind of, <laughs> this is this, this is this guy's idea, a kind of a world domination scheme almost among the, that it's their time to essentially run the world. And that, and that he claims, and he's you know, given speaks at Brookings Institution, very established places, that this is the actual goal of the Chinese military establishment, which is they don't want to just become the regional hegemon in Asia. They don't want to just call the shots there. They have an actual <laughs> world domination strategy. Do you buy into that at all? Do you think it's partially true? Do you think it's just, or that these maybe these maybe they do have it, but the Chinese defense establishment just isn't that much in control? Well, a boy can dream, you know. Um, <laughs> I, you know, as a uh, as a practical matter, I think that the. Uh, the general uh, drift is that uh, China will achieve parity with the uh, United States militarily in Asia in around 2050, which is, I guess, what, you know, 30 years from now. And everybody who's uh, writing those reports now will probably be retired or dead by then. Um, I think that the uh, Chinese uh, see that uh, basically before they tackle the United States, they got to tackle Asia and they have to tackle India. I think that the uh, the big story in uh, Asian competition is uh, is going to be China versus India. It's not going to be China versus the United States. Maybe in the future, if uh, U.S. policy towards China right now is based on the idea, optimism in U.S.-China policy is based on the idea that China's going to fall on its ass. You know, it used to be we could defeat them handily in a uh, military confrontation. Now we tell our allies in the United States that uh, American institutions, you know, freedom, free markets, and all that stuff are more durable than this rather rickety authoritarian regime in China, and just stick with the United States, and China's going to have a crisis. It's going to fall on its ass. So, um, you know, but of course, uh, you know, Trump sort of blew that one out. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, now, now maybe, you know, some Chinese guy is saying, yeah, you know, America's going to fall on its ass, and, uh, you know, we can move in there. You know, the... Uh, Right now, you know, it's, it's it's just not practical, and you know, nobody's uh, you know, everybody's got plans for everything. But uh, you know, the idea that the United States is, uh, you know, that uh, which still I think outspends China two to one, is uh, is going to uh, bend its knee to China, particularly in the uh, Western Hemisphere, is uh, I think a little premature. But um, China, I don't think is a major expansionist power territorially, but they do want to uh, they do want to lick India. And that's going to be their uh, that's going to be their first priority. I would think the arms manufacturers would not be sad about that, the competition between India and China. Mm -hmm. Both well, of them gearing up. Well, one of the big deals in the Obama administration was this totally over the top romance between uh, Ashton Carter and uh, India. You know. I got, I got my, I got some serious problems with India as, a, you know, as a, as a government and all that sort of stuff. But uh, you know, Ash Carter, he was, he was basically, he was really trying to push uh, India into becoming a formal containment ally of the United States. And one reason is that, yeah, it's got the heft. It's got 1.2 billion people over there. But the other reason is, yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna turn the crank on military equipment. The uh, traditionally, the Indians had purchased from the Russians. And you know this was a this was a chance for us to get in there and get that good old U.S. gear in there. 
So Peter, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up this interview? No, it's just great to be here. And uh, I think that uh, we're moving into it. As I said in, in one of my pieces, a post-Trump Asia. And uh, I think it's important to bring uh, perspectives on Asia that are not U.S.-centric into the mix more and more to understand what's going on over there. And I appreciate the opportunity to be able to come on your show and talk about it. Well, we appreciate you coming on so much and enjoyed our time with you. Okay. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye. And that's our show. I want to thank you for listening and a special thank you to Peter Lee. You can see him on Twitter at China Hand. You can see his reports on China, China Watch at NewsBuds YouTube channel or visit his website, chinamatters.blogspot.com. If you'd like to support the show for as little as $5 a month, please visit us at Patreon, patreon.com slash around the empire. Go make a one-time donation, dan at shatterproof.com at PayPal. Questions, comments, just want to yell at me, dan at shatterproof.com. And please see my and Joanne's work at shatterproof.com. See you next time. Thank you.